Welcome to the podcast. It's dedicated to making you a faster cyclist, the Ask a Cycling Coach podcast presented by Trainer Road. I'm Coach Jonathan Lee with a special episode here with you today. We have uh, two members of the Cliff Pro team with us tuning in from Fayetteville, Arkansas. We have Sofia Gomez Villafanier. How are you doing, Sofia? Good. Thanks for having me on, Jonathan. Good to have you back. Uh, it's been a while since we've seen you in person, uh, pandemic times and whatnot, but it's happy to, there's good to have you back. And then we also have a first, a new guest for us on the podcast, Russell Finsterwald. What's up, Russ? Not much. How are you this today, Jonathan? Good, man. It's exciting to have you. Um, yeah, so thanks both for bringing you, me on. Yeah, happy to. Uh, so both of you have raced the, just this past weekend, you raced the Pro XCT, or the US Cup. I can't remember which uh, they're called or even if it's one of the same. They're in Fayetteville. <laughs> Uh, this weekend, we're going to talk about that. But we're also going to talk about Pan American Games that you did recently, and this is an interesting thing because not a lot of people keep up with like the Continental Championships like this. There's the European Champion that we see often in like the road side of things. They'll have that white kit with blue and then the yellow stars on there, but we don't hear often about the Pan American Games or any of the ones that occur on different continents all throughout the U- uh, all throughout the world. So uh, we'll talk about that and also about Olympic qualification. I think this is an interesting topic. Sure, all of us listen to this are probably, well, not all of us, maybe some of us are not going to the Olympics. But at the same time, I think it's really interesting to know what these athletes uh, are going through, how it works. Then we're going to talk about uh, some questions that some people have submitted as well. So uh, excited to have both of you on here for this one. If you're listening to this right now on a podcast, you can listen, or you can obviously listen, you can share, and you can rate the podcast. And then also, if you're watching on video, you can give us a thumbs up uh, in this YouTube video, and uh, we're happy to have you. So let's just jump straight into things. Uh, first, Sophia, you are from Argentina, and you race for Argentina, and Russell, you're from the U.S. and you're actually the current marathon, uh, cross country marathon mountain bike champion. Uh, and then Sophia, you're the current cross country Olympic champion from Argentina and yep. short track as well. Is that correct? Mm-hmm. So you wear two jerseys all at once, which is uh, fantastic. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, but let's get so with that in context here. Can we talk about how riders qualify for the Olympics? Like, how does it even work? How do you get selected? And I don't know who wants to take this first here, but um, maybe Sophia, you can lead from your perspective with Argentina, cause I'm sure that it's different for how it works in the United States as well, but how does Olympic qualification work and how do you get there, Sophia? Yeah. So there's two different parts to the whole program. You have part one that it's nation qualification and it's just the IOC says, this is how we're going to have countries allotted their quotas. And then within each country, each country has their own selection criteria process. They might have auto qualification races. It might just all be a committee base. It totally, no rules on that one really. Um, So how it works for the IOC, we have X amount of spots available total. So I think it's, uh, it's equal men and equal women have the same amount of starting spots. And we go through a two year Olympic cycle that starts in June or it's like a May, June, and it goes one year and that's cycle one. And then you have cycle two that would lead up into what was going to be May of 2020. Um, And within each cycle, they take your top three riders of each nation, add up the amount of UCI points they received on that. And then they put each country into a ranking. And right now the current rules are if your country falls within the top 21st countries, you're guaranteed a spot. If you're first or second nation, you get three spots, which is how the US women, for example, are very likely gonna have three spots. If you're third through, I believe seventh, your country spot gets two and eighth through 21st gets one. And that being said, you have a ranking for men and a ranking for women. So in the US side, Girls are likely going to have three spots. Men are likely to have only one. In Argentina, for us, the women are likely to have one spot. Men, I don't think they're going to qualify. So that's how they filled the majority of the quotas. And then there are a few exceptions to the rule. For example, if you are the host nation, you're guaranteed a starting spot. So that's another quota added. And then there is a way to qualify because not every country has top athletes that can qualify a bunch of points. But if you're one of the best in the world, like uh, Danny from Mexico, 
she's able to qualify through continental championships, which were in 2019 that it said, you know, once the Olympic cycles close, which is going to be after the World Cups, the highest rider of a non-qualified nation from Pan Am's 2019 gets a quota. So in 2019, like I think Danny finished third behind two Americans. So she's likely to get that. Um, And in the men's, it was Rafael Gagne won from Canada, but Canada is likely to qualify. So we'll go to Mexico. And I believe there's three spots up for grabs at the world championships that happened in 2019. And then from that, there is like, if any country says like, oh, we're not going to send athletes or, you know, we're going to decline our invitation, then it kind of goes into a UCI overall ranking. So it's really kind of complicated how it all it's works. A lot. Um, yeah, it's a big process. <laughs> yeah. And it's a, and it's a numbers game too. And, you know, within each cycle, your riders that are giving you guys points don't necessarily have to be the same. Um, so sometimes when you're looking at the ranking, you see four riders and that's because in cycle one you had rider one two and three giving you points but cycle two you had a rider injured so someone else is able to pick up the points um so yeah it's all based on like uci points ranking and that's why you see all of us racing in really weird places those two years leading up to the olympics because we're trying just to get the most amount of spot of points for our country to make sure that we have a guaranteed quota spot you know to participate at the games so is that russ why like you are racing all over like you you know you do all sorts of mountain biking between short track all the way up to like multi-day long super long stage races and even bike packing stuff um <laughs> but uh within that was that why you were going to like israel to go do the israel epic and like all those different races that you were doing were you on that road of getting that campaign to get points Yeah, exactly. So the last cycle, I guess the second cycle of the Olympic point selection, I was the third scoring rider. So that's why um, Keegan and I partnered up to go to Israel um, to try to get points. Um, There for a bit, the U.S. was kind of like right on the bubble of possibly getting two spots. So um, we were kind of making a push to try to make that happen. Um, Ultimately, it doesn't look like it was going to happen or it is going to happen. So um, at the end of the day, maybe it wasn't worth it, but it was still a good experience to go over there and do it. And I think, um, you have to go for it. You have to try. So it was, it was fun to do that. So that's got to like shift a whole lot of your training though, for those two years leading up to it. I mean, first I, you really are building for your whole career up to something that's such of such big importance, but did your, did Russ, did your training calendar get adjusted because of that? Like, would you, if the Olympics didn't exist, would you have done different races? Um, probably, I probably wouldn't have gone to Israel and done that stage race. (laughs) Um, but at the end of the day, like it was still good training for Bentonville and everything. So, cause that was the last pro XCT that I believe was two weeks after Israel. So really my training didn't alter too much for it. Um, if anything, like I just used Israel as training for Bentonville in a way, cause Mm -hmm. sort of at the end of the season, sometimes your motivation's a little low and you don't want to go do a bunch of intervals for one race that's a month apart from another race. So there was Israel ended up filling a nice gap in racing and was able to provide some intensity for other goals and everything. So for me, there was real, really no reason not to do it. Hmm. So interesting to see like that, like you said, there's so many moving parts and edge cases and depending on the country you're in, it could be like, uh, Daniela Campusano, she's got like a really crazy, like a bunch of edge cases that she's probably working on for this. Uh, super interesting. Yep. Yeah, it's almost like building a pyramid. There's just so many different layers to it. And you really have to understand the system pretty well to maximize it, to benefit you the best way possible, really. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see how Tokyo goes. <clears throat> hopefully it goes off and then hopefully the, the we'll see that course and everything else, how it'll play out. It'll be interesting. Um, can, can we talk about Pan American Games really quick? So uh, what are Russ, can you explain which countries participate in Pan Am, like where it's at, uh, if that changes all the basic context of the race? Yeah. So every continent, um, has its own continental championships, um, for North America, we part, we're linked up with South America. So the Pan Am games are essentially North and South America competing together. Um, and yeah, the venue changes every year, historically, 
Um, they seem to land in South America for the most part. Um, Mexico, Colombia, Argentina are all common countries that host them. Um, and they're a really awesome event that in the U.S. we don't really hear a lot about them, but in South America they're huge. And some of the races, some of the Pan Ams have been the most crowds I've ever seen at a race. Um, it's really cool. The local communities come out and they support them. They're super passionate about it, and they're excited to have you there. So Pan Ams always end up being one of my favorite races of the year and some of my best memories racing throughout my career, just because they're such a cool cultural experience. You get to see a new part of the world and the courses are always fun to race too. You never know what you're going to get because it's a new venue. Um, yeah. But yeah, Pan Ams, they have a lot of UCI points. They're, um, I, I believe they're more than a World Cup. Sophia might know the, how they break mm -hmm. down better, but I think it, there's more points than winning a World Cup. So that's um, pretty huge in terms of Olympic qualification points and everything. Um, and yeah, for this year they were in Puerto Rico, which was really cool. Um, we didn't get to have them in 2019 due to COVID. So it was a good opportunity to go down and score some points. They, um, they did it in a cool way. They had a UCI race the weekend before Pan Ams this year. Um, and there was also the first Pan Ams short track. So there was, um, over basically I was able to do four races in seven days, which was pretty neat. So that's awesome. Yeah, so it was this has got to be tough though, because like Sophia, you're keenly familiar with this because of kind of living like a bi-hemispheric lifestyle of living in North America and training here, but then also like going down and racing national championships and different events down in Argentina. It's a totally different season, of course. So that it's mirrored from what we're experiencing in the Northern hemisphere. That's got to be tough because Puerto Rico is especially is probably really hot and humid and all these riders in South America have had a summer of getting used to training and riding in the heat versus you up in the north. It's cold still. So working down to something like that, is it always, is that always a disadvantage that North American riders in particular would, would face in this case? I think it depends. And I'll just go back to quickly go back to a few things yeah. that Russell said. Um, Pan Ams doesn't have quite as many points as the World Cups. It's like right below it. I think a World Cup win is 200. Pan Ams is 150. Um, and yeah, that was like the only, yeah, points wise. Um, but it, the only thing that matters, the only difference really that we, I feel the most is that I, in a normal year, I show up to Pan Ams and it's, if I'm lucky, my third race of the season when I have, you know, fellow teammates from the national team, that that would be their maybe eighth or ninth race that they're doing. So I think it's a little bit of that race speed that we're kind of missing. But at the same time, our competitions in the U.S. currently are very hard. And you have World Cup, you have, you know, girls and men that will place really high in the World Cups. So although we don't have the same amount of races in our legs, our intensity that we show up at a race, it we're just a little bit, it's like on another level almost. Like I know, you know, Pan Ams in 2019 in Mexico, um, you know, when you look at the list, I think, you know, Danny was third and then I was maybe eighth or ninth. And then maybe the top 10 were really all North American, really all North American based racers. Um, so it, yeah, it's like, we don't have the early number season of races, but somehow we're still able to show up and perform really well. And a lot of us are lucky enough that no matter where we live, we're able to escape to somewhere that we're able to train. So, you know, myself and Russell spend the whole winter in Tucson. And I think the coldest training day was maybe 55 degree day like i think we I had didn't a ride really... that day either i think you were the only one that rode <laughs> yeah <laughs> exactly so, yeah so it's not it you know we're lucky enough that we have the opportunity to leave home because both colorado springs and utah are you know not the place that you want to be but there are pro racers like evelyn dong and rose grant that stick out the winter at home and they make it work for them so i think a lot of it too is just the mindset that you're coming in. If you go into a race and you're like, well, I'm already at a disadvantage because A, B, C, and D, then you're already 
you're already putting in an excuse before you even start because you just never know how your body's going to feel. And I think some of us, you can race just as good early season and late season where some of us also require a few races to get into that rhythm and having that ability to suffer. Um, and lucky enough us in Tucson, normally we're able to do the shootout on Saturdays, which is this really, really hard 45 minute effort that we do really early in the morning on a Saturday. And it gives us that race intensity. And I think that is pretty key, you know, and I think it's why a lot of people do go to Tucson in the winter because they're able to get that high intensity without having to pin a number on. Yeah. A lot of amateur racers probably, and and sorry, Russ, I didn't, it looked like you were going to say something there. I don't want to interrupt you. Oh, no worries. I was just going to mention one other thing that, um, Sophia Keegan and I were all doing leading into Pan Ams. Um, we also do introduce, uh, sauna protocol into our training to help with some heat adapt, heat adaptation. Um, so we were all doing, um, I think our programs were a little different, um, but we all did about 20 to 30 minutes of time in a sauna just to adapt to the heat to prepare for those hot events, which for me seems to work better than anything else. I I'm a big fan of sauna protocol. Yeah. It's kind of nice because you can separate it from trying to hit your high marks and like training and introducing all of the fatigue while doing it in a really hot environment. You can kind of separate that, right? If you right. try to heat at or do heat adaptation, hardest word to say ever, by the way, um, <laughs> for anybody listening to this, but Glad I'm not you, alone. <laughs> yeah. If you try to do that while you're trying to like hit your high power numbers, it's just so fatiguing. And it can be really damaging to subsequent workouts and your ability to actually, you know, follow the desired trajectory for your training. So being able to separate it like that's awesome. Uh, we actually did an episode of the Science of Getting Faster podcast with Dr. Chris Minson, who is one of the foremost and leading researchers on heat training. So if you're listening to this oh, wow. now and you want to find out more about that, you should go check out that episode. He has a lot of practical tips on how to implement it, a uh, lot the science behind it. We go deep into the studies that he has. It's awesome. So. Um, I, that was one of the things I was going to ask you because I want to get into how you adjust your season for this. This is something that amateur racers experience pretty frequently. It's not Pan American games. It's not something big, but their friend might invite, ha- ask them to do an event with them or something comes up on the calendar and they're really excited by it, but it's has nothing to do with the a race or it's really far away from like the big main goal of the year. So the question comes up, like, how do I pivot my training and how do I change all of my training to focus on this near term event? So were you, for all of you, since you didn't know if any of these events would be happening because of COVID and everything else, it's tricky this year. Did you have to shift your training substantially? And were you like, would you consider a peak that you reached for Pan American games? Or is this simply a building block on the way to something larger? Do you want to take that one, Russell, first? And then, because I know yeah. we're going to have very different answers. Yeah, <laughs> I, yeah, I can go first. Um, so, yeah, I think for Pan Ams, um, between Sophia and I, we both had completely different objectives at that race. Um, for Sophia, it was a huge Olympic qualifier for her. Um, whereas for me, it was more, I wanted to go down there to get a few races in my legs. Um, it normally takes me a couple of races before I feel like I'm really going. Um, so, I just wanted to go down there. Um, the goal was to get some UCI points because I didn't do any UCI races last year. I was starting the season with zero points. So a big goal was to get the UCI points and just get race experience in my legs for, um, the bigger races that are important to me later this season. So I wouldn't say I was necessarily peaking for Pan Ams. Um, I just wanted to go down there and have a good result. So I did go into it like fresh and everything, but, um, yeah, wasn't peaking by any means for it. Got it. How about you, Sophia? Yeah, like Russell said, for me, Pan Ams is a really big deal um, just because it matters a lot to my federation, uh, both the Cycling Federation and the entity that manages a lot of the funding that we get as a sport. So for us, being able to deliver a medal where it is in the men or the women's race really determines what budget we're going to have in the coming years because if we're not able to deliver medals then they really just start cutting programs um so for me pan ams i've always put it as a a race actually um is it truly an a race probably not because i don't have the race intensity that i would like but i do do a lot of 
intervals. Well, my, my training does have a lot of intervals to begin with, but <laughs> I do do a lot of VO2 efforts going into Pan Ams just because that is linked to so much more like my, um, I have a government stipend that I get for my medal I got at Lima, Con- Lima uh, Games a few years ago. And that only gets validated as long as I keep showing my potential and my results. And for us, Pan Ams was, is a, one of the things that they're looking at if Argentina women can get a spot to Tokyo. You know, at first, it was supposed to be 40% of our selection criteria plus nationals 2019 plus UCI points. So had they kept it that way, I would have locked in my Tokyo uh, spot if, as long as we qualify one, but now like three days before they're like, Oh, we're going to look at Pan Ams and we're going to look at the world cups best two out of three. So for me now, having been the highest place Argentine rider at Pan Ams in the cross country race, all I have to do is once again, be the highest place Argentine rider at World Cup one or two, and then the spot would be mine. Um, so for me, it's, yeah, I come into it pretty good. And it's always nice to start the season, you know, kind of running on all cylinders rather than like slowly peeking into it. Cause it's hard to show up at a race and, you know, not deliver a result that you know that you're capable of. Uh, but then again, after I go to the world cups in May, when I come back, I have a week that I'm just hitting the reset button just because we're really pushing the envelope early season. And I'm going to need that kind of break of, okay, either I need to reset because I'm going to Tokyo or I need to reset because I messed up and I am not going to be an Olympian. So (laughs) it, uh, it kind of changes. Yeah. It's yeah. I don't know if that answers your question. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. And it actually touched on the next point that I wanted to cover. Maybe Rusty can kick us off on this one because managing expectations coming into an event like that can be really hard for people. Like it's a, it's a big event, but at the same time, it may not be your like number one priority, but still when you race, like you never, you always want to win, right? Like you're a racer. So Russ, how did you like, how do you manage expectations so that you come into this race with like the proper expectations, but then also how do you then not like, uh, double cross yourself thereafter and kind of like, say like, well, why didn't you win or why didn't you do anything like that? So can you kind of walk us through how you, and kind of give us insight into your psyche and how you handle that? Yeah, definitely. Like, um, it's never when you go to a race and you don't quite get the result you're looking for, it can always be frustrating, but I think it's important to like reflect on it immediately after you finish and there's always silver linings. Like you need to look at what you did well out there, um, what you could have improved on. Um, but ultimately I think it's important to find the positives, um, within a lackluster result or something. Um, for me, like Pan Ams, I didn't get the result I was looking for. Um, even considering it as a training race. Um, but the weekend before it was a really hot, I've typically struggled in the heat. Um, but I felt like I executed a race really well in the heat. So that was a positive takeaway for me. And um, I just noted everything I did right in the heat and applied that to future races. So um, yeah, there were still some positives to take away from it. Um, and I think it's really important when you do have a bad race, not to let it beat you up too much. Um, I mean, we race so much that if you let one race bother you, it's just going to put you in this cycle and put you in this hole that it's going to make it hard to dig yourself out of for future races. Um, so, I mean, I've been racing for professionally for over 10 years now. I've had a fair share of not so great races and you just have to move on. Um, don't let it bother you too much. Just immediately move on and focus for the next one. Um, give yourself 15 minutes to be disappointed in yourself or upset and then immediately reset and move on. And I think that seems to work the best. Yeah. And I like that approach of taking what you can from it within that short period thereafter, because after the race, like, like I, you know, I tend to be very emotionally hard on myself after a hard, after a bad result. Yep. 
and having an objective process to put in place to analyze the race thereafter would probably help you avoid that like <laughs> period of time where you're just beating yourself up need needlessly after the result. Yeah. Cause definitely like even in your worst races, there's still going to be things that you did well. Um, and it's important to recognize those achievements within the race, I think. Yeah. And this is something that just like internally at our company, we've been talking about, uh, even just this morning. Um, but there's this concept of like, you know, chasing perfection versus chasing progress. Right. right. And if you look at everything in terms of chasing progress, then mistakes are also, as long as you learn from those mistakes, that's, that's, that's progress. Yep. Like it, it's, it's, you know, that's getting closer to the end goal. So it's, it's always opportunities for it for sure. Uh, Sophia, how about you? How do you, do you have anything to add on that on managing expectations, especially when you were saying that and you're talking about the government stipend and also the likely one Olympic slot that Argentina might have to send an athlete to, for mountain biking. Like that's a lot of pressure. Um, how do you manage the expectations of all that pressure? Yeah, I think it's a interesting scenario. I haven't been doing this long enough to have ever felt that kind of pressure. You know, I think when they first even released the whole Olympic thing of how they were going to select who goes, it was the week of nationals and, you know, we were racing a Sunday and then that Thursday we got the email. Oh, Hey, by the way, nationals is 30% of your Olympic criteria. And you're like, Whoa, Whoa. So like, you know, you race that your expectations kind of change because yeah, at the end of the day, you want to give it a hundred percent, but you're gonna be a little more cautious. So like for me at Pan Am's, I like the day before I wasn't really feeling that well. So I was like kind of laying in bed trying to, you know, say, hey, let's relax. Let's not worry about it. You never know what's going to happen tomorrow. And when we started, you know, I was kind of feeling good. I was like, okay, I'm going to hold on, you know, not really push it, just hide. And Danny made an attack I wasn't able to follow. And then um, I was planning on catching her on the descent, but then Kelsey passed me and we just started to lose time and we could never quite catch on. And at one point I was like, okay, do I focus on trying to win this race and maybe blow up in the heat? That is very likely because I do not do well in the heat. Or do I let Kelsey do the majority of the work because she's being super aggressive and won't let me lead a DH. So I'm like, well, you can do all the work. It's fine by me. And, you know, play more of a mind game knowing that all I'm really here for is to be top Argentinian, like goal number one, you know, regardless of what happens, that's the big goal. And it does change how you race the race because you're not willing to take those high risks that could come with huge rewards. So for me, I raced a race that was like very conservative and I timed a sprint at the very end and I was able to get by Kelsey when she did the majority of the work. And, you know, after, like, after the race, I had to go to a bush and I like puked for a good, like five to 10 minutes. And I was like, I have never felt so bad within like my body is like, I think the heat, the pressure, I was just so overwhelmed with like, Oh, like what is happening? Like, I don't know. I think it's, you know, something I've been working with my coach and I need to like keep reminding myself is that yes, we have this really big ambition of, turning me from a cat one racer to an Olympian in four now five years with the Olympics being postponed. But at the end of the day, becoming an Olympian or not doesn't define who I am and it doesn't define the type of racer I am. So is kind of keeping that in perspective that if I make it to the highest level, amazing. But if I don't, I'm still going to continue in this path of, you know, trying to progress and become a better cyclist at the end of the day. So I think it, it just gets hard because a lot of people have this, you know, this dream of, I want to be an Olympian. And, you know, for me, it's a goal. It's nothing I've ever dreamed of because I didn't grow up watching the Olympics or knowing what mountain bike racing was, or really just having any clue about elite level sports aside from, you know, soccer down in South America. So I think it, you know, as an athlete, we're so accustomed to attaching ourselves to results and, you know, what, oh, I was able to go to a world cup and I have done X amount of world championships, but, you know, at the end of the day, we're just racing in circles in a dirt field. So, <laughs> like, you know, gotta keep it all in perspective and 
for sure easier said than done. And I got to keep reminding myself of that, but, um, yeah, it's a, it's quite the process and it's something that, you know, us elite level athletes kind of forget to keep in check quite a bit, I think. Yeah. A lot of us amateur athletes listening to this, we many times, we, well, you know, our circumstances aren't certainly that, that dire or that like, you know, we don't have that high bar to reach for, you know, but hope I, I gleaned a lot from, from your insight and thanks for sharing that too, because it, there's this like a- external perspective. Thanks to both of you for sharing that where, you know, you're not fully satisfied in your results or you struggle at times because there's this external perspective that like pro athletes are this impenetrable force of success. <laughs> so it's always nice to have insight into the reality. Um, Russ, with this race, you mentioned that you executed well in the heat. What did you do well this time that you have perhaps not done in the past? Or what did you avoid doing this time that you have done in the past that made you more successful? Yeah, I think like for me, it started um, essentially six weeks before the race. Um, and that was when I, as we mentioned earlier, jumping into the sauna, um, that seems to help me quite a bit. Um, but more so on race day, um, just really focused on keeping my core temperature as cool as possible. Um, so we all race or when we're warming up, um, there's kind of the pro trick of buying pantyhose, stuffing them with ice and having that tucked in your Jersey just to kind of melt and the water runs down your back. So that helps keep you cool. I always start with one as well. Um, and in years past, um, bottle dumps, like just dumping cold water on yourself as much as possible in the race. I used to not like that cause I felt like it shocked my system. Um, in races, but I've slowly grown to liking it more. And I think that helps me quite a bit, just spraying my legs with cold water, spraying my arms. Um, so I don't really dump it on my core cause I don't like that. That's where I get like the shock and I like tense up. Mm-hmm. So just kind of spraying the legs and the arms, I think cools my body down pretty well. Um, and a lot of it I think is pacing as well. Um, I, sometimes I admittedly don't pace myself the best in the races. I always want to be at the front and in the action and hold on as long as I can. Um, and in heat, you can't really do that. You kind of, even though it's a mass start event in a way you have to race it like a time trial. Um, with that said, you still have to race for wheels and everything. Um, but you really need to keep in mind the whole effort. We're out there for 90 minutes. The race isn't won in the first lap when it's 90 degrees. So, um, I, I felt like in my starts, I normally like to be aggressive, move up as quick as possible. Um, but there in Puerto Rico, I just accepted letting people jump by me if I didn't feel like it was worth burning a couple matches to move up one spot. So, um, just really being conservative in the heat, I think play pays dividends over the long run of the race. And, you know, if you still have that energy to sprint for wheels, save it for the last lap, because that's when it'll matter the most. That's when other people will be hurting the most. Um, so yeah, a lot of it just comes down to preparation and racing style. Um, for me racing in heat, I change, have to change my tactics and that seems to help the most. So it's hard for me, but, um, trying to get better at it. <laughs> yeah. Especially cause you've had 10 years at this, so you've been able to race and, and also you've raced through a transition in generation, right? Where you had like existing kind of like the incumbent all stars of the American mountain bike scene. And then you've you or the new generation. And now there's an even younger generation of kids coming up. So you're getting to like span all three of these. It's really interesting, uh, probably to see how the racing has changed. Yeah, definitely. It's yeah. It's changed quite a bit throughout my years. <laughs> Makes yeah, me feel old. No doubt. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure most people listening to this are probably somewhere around, you know, like, uh, we're talking probably in their thirties to fifties. So they're probably laughing at this, right? So, um, <laughs> But, uh, okay. With that said, can we get into a handful of questions? Just actually two of them that athletes have submitted that I thought would be fantastic for, for you two to answer. Um, first one is going to be from Jared. He says, Hey, podcast stars. And you're included in that, by the way, since you're on the podcast this week, um, (laughs) he Mm -hmm. says after years of road racing at a cat one level, I've almost entirely shifted to a mountain bike focus over the course of the pandemic racing disappeared. And I decided to try something new and I absolutely love it. That said, I'm completely confused about something and I want your input. I've always been a high power athlete at around 180 pounds and 360 to 390 watt FTP. So that's a big athlete and that's a lot of power that they're putting out as well. 
Uh, but my power data at cross country races is shockingly low. I say shockingly low because I feel like I've never done such hard efforts, but even my normalized power is only about 80% of FTP after 90 minutes of racing. So I know mountain biking has coasting and technical terrain that requires coasting, but even though I have that coasting time, I'm completely exhausted. And while I could absolutely do a normalized power of my threshold in a 90 minute crit or your road race, I can't even fathom doing that in a mountain bike race. So why is this? Is this normal for everybody? How do I raise my power in an XC race? Is that, uh, who wants to jump in first on this one? Sophia, actually, you, you should probably kick us off because you mentioned even like intensity factor of a recent race being somewhere around 0.8. Was that right? Yeah. Like this past Sunday race, I, uh, like I came into, I put in a big training week coming into it and had a big load and I was like, we'll see what happens. Um, and I think my IF score was point eight one for the cross country race but if i go back and i look at early season race cactus cup two and a half hours intensity factor of one somehow and i set a <laughs> bunch of new like power prs on the mountain bike so you know it's so course dependent um you know i think one of the things you have to also realize in mountain biking is that power isn't the whole story. And I think we get so, oh, watts per kilo, watts per kilo, watts per kilo. But in a mountain bike race, it's not so cut and dry. You know, you have uh, climbs that aren't all the way consistent. You know, you have berms where you most of the time actually like have to stop pedaling. You have to do a lot more accelerations on and off. You're fighting for wheels a lot more. Yes, you have the descents that you're not pedaling, and um, you have a bunch of technical sections where maybe your power isn't as high. And, you know, he says that when he finishes, um, like he finishes super tired as well. Um, mm -hmm. So, it, you know, the, high, the best thing you can do is just become a better rider in a way and maybe analyze in the race, like analyze your climbs. Cause that's really where the power, you know, the climbs and the flats, that's really where you can put lap to lap, you know, power analysis and see like, okay, in this climb, I was able to do X amount of Watts and it took me this amount of time. And then, you know, maybe the lap before like, okay, in the climb, I can see how I went a little bit slower and that's like the time difference. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it's so hard. Like, in mountain biking, power gives you a ticket to the party, but it doesn't mean anything because if you don't know how to descend, if you don't know how to, you know, properly take turns or how to um, use your efforts properly and gauge the amount of times that you're going over the red zone, which in mountain biking, it's so much more about on off efforts that if you are not used to, you know, doing 40 attack, you know, 40 efforts at zone six that lasts over 15 seconds, your power is just going to start dropping and dropping and dropping. So I think the best thing that you can do is, you know, ride mountain bike trails more, ride them fast, and maybe find a local little course that you can do where you go out and do, you know, a 40 to a 60 minute effort where you're doing four, five, six, seven laps and really practice that time consistency within your race. And don't worry so much about power, but just look at time because that is really, you know, you could have one that has really high power, but your time was low because you were just sprinting really high efforts and then slamming on the brakes and all the descents where maybe if you do a lap where you're a lot more smoother in your transitions between climbs and descents, you'll find, oh, I was actually, you know, 20 watts less, but my time was 20 seconds more. Um, mm. So I think, you know, don't look at your power when you're racing mountain bikes because you should be going hard enough that, you know, you're not looking at your Garmin. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What do you say, Russ? Yeah, I think Sophia kind of touched on it a little bit. Um, in mountain bike racing, you're rarely riding at or near your threshold. It's either like you're doing zero watts or you're doing 450 watts. And um, like I just looked at my um, file from the race yesterday and I spent um, 25 minutes over VO2 max, which 25 minutes in a 90 minute effort, that's quite a bit considering maybe a third of the race you were coasting. 
So I think like we've all done VO2 workouts and even when you do a VO2 workout, that's just 15 minutes of intensity. You see that power fade where at the end you're sometimes barely milking out your threshold just to get through the workout. So I think that, I mean, essentially that's what mountain biking is. You're doing these really hard, high efforts and inevitably um, your power is going to have this sort of drop off. And I think that's where you see the average get near or low, lower than your threshold is just because of the nature of the effort. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of things you can work on to improve that. Um, but at the end of the day, I think mountain biking isn't a power based sport. So I wouldn't worry too much about it. It's um, more as Sophia mentioned, just being smooth, efficient, and fast. Um, like I've followed enough pro racers that you see different racing styles and someone like Jeff Kabush, he's so smooth everywhere and he never looks like he's trying. Um, but I bet his normalized power is much higher than someone who's sprinting all the time just because of the way he does his efforts out there. So um, a little bit of it is rider dependent and racing style. But I think at the end of the day, most mountain bike efforts, you will see your normalized power kind of be lower than your threshold or right around it. When you talk about Jeff as, as a good example, a past podcast guest as well. Uh, when you say that he's like probably able to drive a higher normalized power than somebody who's just sprinting out of every turn, is that like, why is that in your, in your opinion, of course, you're not Jeff, but why would you think that would be the case? Yeah, I think cause he's just like, just following him. He's super smooth and efficient with where he uses his power. Um, so a lot of times we call it the Jeff Bush sag where he'll be like a bike length off the back and he's just kind of doing his own race, but he's still in the front group. And I think that's cause he knows where he wants to use his power. And so he's either on or off more so than sprinting, grabbing break. And when you do that, I think that drops your normalized power, whereas being steady and consistent kind of helps, um, keep it higher. Um, it'd be interesting to see I, that my theory might be wrong, but I would feel like his might be a little higher than the average racer just because of his style. Yeah. We need Jeff to come out and do the next round in Fayetteville, Jeff. Uh, we're asking <laughs> him to do that. So come race. So then we can analyze your power file in relation to others. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, I did, and th- kind of like what you were talking about, Sophia, just this past week, uh, since racing is coming around for, for myself as well now, and I'm really excited about it, but I have like zero intensity. I mean, other than training intensity, but no race intensity, it's kind of like a difference between actually, maybe this is a reason why as well. Like when you feel like you're kind of getting boxed around by somebody, like you're in the ring and they're boxing you around, it's a lot harder to execute on your plan and to feel you'd like you're on top of the ball and to do it with the same amount of efficiency that you, uh, same amount of efficiency that you would in training. It's like, what I'm getting at with this is when you're in a cross country race and the course is forcing you to put out higher power than you would anticipate for different times. than you would anticipate different durations or riders are forcing you to do that. It's suddenly like you can't adhere to like a structure or a plan. And instead it's like, Whoa, like plans out the window and I've got to go really, really hard. And sometimes that can that's really tough to stay on top of things mentally. So for that reason, I put Pete on an e-bike. He's a big crit racer. I put him on an e-bike and then tried to hold onto his wheel for as long as I could on a XCO course. But Pete mentioned something. Cause at the end I was like completely destroyed, but I was like, huh, the power really isn't that high from that. And Pete said something that I thought was really insightful. He said, there's so many different ways to arrive at the power that you did. And what we just did is probably the hardest way to get there. Yeah. And that's like something that I think of with mountain biking is it's one of the harder ways to get to the average that whatever it, it may be at the end of that race, because of the fact that it's off and on and because you're constantly fighting traction too. So like putting out 300 Watts on a paved surface versus putting out 300 Watts on something where you have to have a lot of nuance in how you're applying that power to be able to maintain traction. That takes a ton of work. Yeah. And everything else. There's just like, there's so many in-betweens between power and technical skill, right? Like there's so many in-betweens that make you a successful racer, I would feel like. So. Right. On a mountain bike, there's just so many different body systems in motion that are working to get you through the race the whole time. Whereas you're just doing an effort on like a 3% gradual climb. You can be cool, relaxed, and just focus on the effort. Whereas mountain biking, you just, like you mentioned, you're in a boxing ring. There's so many things 
variables to it. So much going on. Yeah. Sophia, do you do you ever catch yourself like in terms of power output, like not executing a race like you need to? And do you make adjustments like as a result of that to be able to, like you said, kind of extend your longevity in that race or do anything else like that? Do you find yourself making common like pacing mistakes, so to speak, ever and adjusting for those? I mean, it's so hard because sometimes when you're in a race, you're just in a race and it's <laughs> hard there's not many people that can show up to a race with a race plan and execute the race plan with everything that goes on around you. Um, yeah, they're called the winner, right? Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Only one of those. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Even then a lot of winners sometimes aren't happy. They're like, Oh, I could have done X, Y, and Z better. Or like, you know, should have had a better start or, you know, um, I don't know. I think what I'm working on, myself personally in mountain bike races is I now just have time just so I know when I have to reach back for my um, you know my clip nutrition but I kind of need to ask myself is this as hard as I can go right now in a sustained effort you know like can I go harder and if I say yes I just you know normally means shifting up a gear and picking up my cadence on mountain bike courses um and it's more of a yeah, mental thing, or I always check in on myself on the descent, like, okay, how am I feeling in this group? Am I comfortable? Am I relaxed? Or am I, you know, pinned to the mats? And I need to, you know, if you're pinned, I'm like, I'm not going to go fight to have X, Y, like have that wheel in front of me or whatever. Like, yeah, I'll have my elbows out. And if it means I need to move a little to the left or the right to block someone from passing me, I'll do that. But I won't so actively focus on moving forward unless my purpose is to get to the front and like slow it down. But I never, I don't really do that. Um, and I'm the kind of racer that I love a sprint finish because I think they're exciting to watch and I happen to be naturally really good at sprinting. Um, so for me, it's more of, okay, hang on for as long as you can and see how close you can come on the last lap to, you know, mm -hmm. make it a sprint finish. Um, but yeah. And then the mountain bike race, you never know, like this weekend, there's so many people that broke rims and had flat tires and just chaos everywhere. So, you know, you just, the goal is to have a heart, you know, a good race and just finish the race knowing that you gave everything you had. And yeah. Is there uh so you just mentioned something that I think is pretty profound that a lot of us probably don't realize there's a difference between being like in pain and uncomfortable and suffering and then actually going as fast as you can in that moment or as fast as you should be in that moment. Right. Like it's, it's, that was a good reminder to me to remember the fact that just because you're uncomfortable doesn't mean that you can't do more. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's, that's racing like one oh one, Right. And um, I think that's when it helps, you know, I do it in training a lot, especially when I have over under efforts or, you know, 30 on 30 off where, I don't worry so much about the power I'm hitting. So I don't look at my Garmin. Instead, I look ahead and I'm like, you know, in Tucson, I'd be like, oh, I'm going to get to that cactus over there. Or, you know, I know it's two turns and there's this rock or whatever. Like, you just kind of know what those efforts are. So that in a mountain bike race, when you're coming up a climb, you're like, all right, there's the top. We just go as hard as we can to the top. And it's, you know, you're not so worried about your power numbers. Instead, you're just more keeping your head up and visualizing and putting an effort that is more about the duration and getting you from one place to the other rather than like, okay, I'm going to hit this climb at very impressive 300 watts over here, <laughs> you know, or something like that. Yep. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's, it's an interesting thing to figure out, you know, how you might be super powerful on the road, but yeah, you come to the mountain bike and it's like, well, yeah, you have to be fast enough to be able to go with the punches, but you don't have to be, a, a, you know, at the end of the day, you don't have to be the highest watt per kilo athlete to win a bike race on the mountain bike side. Yeah, for sure. R Russ, can we move into, or do you want to move into Cassidy's or do you have anything else to add to that one? Um, I was just going to sort of touch on like what Sophia said, like she mentioned it with the cactus and Tucson and everything. And I kind of do that same strategy in races. Um, this weekend, there were essentially three main climbs and I just focused each lap. Like I wasn't worried about the next climb just in the moment. You just have to tell yourself, all right, get to the top of this climb as fast as I can, as smooth as I can. And then you just kind of work through the course, like break it into steps as opposed to 
just thinking of the whole laps and saying to yourself, all right, I have three more climbs ahead. I need to pace myself for those. I just break it down into each critical segment within my head and just tell myself to give it the best effort I can for this climb, focus on having a good descent to the next one, and then do it all over again. And for me, like I found it keeps me mentally stimulated throughout the whole race. Like you're not worried about the six more laps you have remaining. Um, cause sometimes like <laughs> discouraging on thoughts. lap one, if you're not feeling good on the first climb, you're like, I'm going to do this. I'm going to have seven more laps of this. This is going to be brutal. So just breaking it down and focusing on what you're doing in the moment seems to help me quite a bit in racing. Awesome. Cool. Good tips. Uh, Cassidy's question. She says, Hey, TR gang, I've been racing XC for nearly 10 years now. And technical skill has always been a barrier for me. I have the fitness, but I dab in technical sections and I just can't seem to get past a mental block on jumps and gaps. I spent all of last year focusing on technical skills, following YouTube tutorials because coaching clinics were hard to find during lockdown. I felt like I saw improvement, but I just did my first race this weekend and I was terrible. So what can I do to level up my skill? I feel like I've been at this for a long time. So saying it just comes with time just doesn't seem to work for me. Um, Cassie sounds pretty discouraged on the technical side. And you actually, this weekend's course had drops and had jumps. And Sophia, I know um, talking to you beforehand about the course, it seems like it had a lot of that stuff. How did you approach the technical side for you? And then what advice would you have for Cassidy on this? Yeah, so it's... <laughs> It's kind of embarrassing, but uh, I had actually quite a big mental block on the drop on the course that we had. You know, I kind of looked at it after short track. It was windy, didn't hit it. Um, then we went out Saturday to do openers. Everybody's there watching like chaos. You know, you can't even get a clear line climbing to the darn thing because you got a train of 20 people waiting for the perfect time to drop. And I just kept looking at it and I was like, oh, I haven't practiced drops, like, nope, not doing it. And I was really bummed at myself that evening and, you know, talking with Baldeck and I messaged my friend Rich who lives here and he, Rich Drew from the ride series, really good person to work with. Yeah, you should look him up because he travels around everywhere. Um, but then I was like, you know what, let's just go early in the morning and let's like try to sneak on course and see if I'll do this drop. And I Baldeck showed me the line once and then I was like you know I just kind of went to the drop didn't hit it and then we went back again and then I hit it and then you know I do not recommend doing that because doing stuff the morning of the race is probably not the smartest thing but it's understanding what works for you in order to hit those technical features like for me I don't do well with an audience and I don't do well when I keep people keep telling me it's easy. It's easy. you got this. You can do this. It, it just doesn't work. Like I need to have the time to go through the process of understanding the feature and understanding the risk involved and what I need to do to correct it. Like for drops, I, my biggest fear is going over the bars. Mm. That's almost, that's why everybody hates drops because you don't want to go over your front end and scorpion off. So understanding like, okay, like the thing I need to make sure every time I go up a drop is drop her down and then get my butt behind my bottom bracket to get that weight back. Because if your front wheel lands first, you're basically good. You know, if you want to land even perfect, but as long as you land front wheel first, that's what controls where your bike goes. You can normally safely get away when your rear wheel doesn't land well, but if you land rear, rear wheel first, you're in trouble because you have no control over that bike. Um, so, you know, if you can do a skill clinic with a coach that you understand and feel comfortable with the way that they're explaining it to you, because sometimes that's really the main thing is just kind of that click of having somebody explain it in a way that you understand it. But then on your day-to-day -day ride is get friends that ride with people that are better than you. You know, when I lived in Durango, my two best friends I had Sarah Sturm that was my fitness best friend that she anytime I had you know she'd be like do you want to go ride I'm like oh, I got four by ten LT in a roll she's like perfect what time are we going and I had a training buddy for that and then I had my friend Brittany who amazing technical rider won lots of enduros downhill races everything and she was like okay when I need to go work on skills I'm going to go ride with Brittany and follow her and try to match her speed as long as possible um, so I think it's just putting yourself in that scenario. And then, you know, at some point you just have to let go of that mental break of 
mental, you know, block of like, okay, I'm going to do this drop and I'm going to do this jump because I know I have the skills. Um, but, you know, sometimes if you have a mental block and you have the mental block and that's okay too, you know, it's not, you don't always, the, the story is never always successful also. So mm-hmm. it's just being able to make a decision at that point of, okay, today I'm willing to take that risk. And normally most of the time when you do it, you're like, oh, okay, I got this. I know how to do this. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, that would be my recommendation of just, you know, ride with people that are better than you and push yourself incrementally. And then over the course of the year, that really adds up to a big difference. Sure. Well, um, Russ, what input do you have on this? Cause you've been racing whether it's world cup courses or plenty of other variety of things. You have a ton of experience with the technical stuff. Yeah, definitely. Like I, I feel like, um, I'd consider myself a pretty decent technical rider. Um, but same thing, like sometimes at these world cups, there's always these features and features draw crowds. And a lot of the times you psych yourself out just because you see people scared or intimidated to ride it or standing around a feature, it gives it this sort of fear factor that doesn't necessarily exist. If you were by yourself and you look at the feature and say, you know what, this is not that bad. I can ride this. So, um, I recognize that cause I used to sometimes stand around a feature for 20, 30 minutes and just look at it and you see people execute it really well. And you also see people go through it and they don't make it look smooth. And that, those are the people that kind of freak you out saying that could be me. I could almost crash if I do it. Um, so sort of, I recognize that at one point and my approach changed to how I tackle those technical features. Um, instead of stopping and looking at it too much, um, I would stop, see what a couple people do, find my line and just say, I have to ride it now and just do it instead of, because a lot of the things you'll find yourself eventually riding, um, but you have to get through that mental block of doing it. So I found just accepting that you're going to do it at a certain point and going for it seems to work best for me. Like, um, the drop this weekend was intimidating looking. Um, there were tons of rocks around it. It was probably five foot, um, five feet of total air time and you had a bunch of rocks you needed to clear. Um, so just looking at it, the intimidation factor was high, but when you actually look at the line you're riding, it was one that it's not super challenging. I think there were actually harder things on the course to ride, but they didn't look nearly as hard. So recognizing the intimidation factor of certain things and just saying, you know what, it's actually not that bad. My skills are more than capable of doing this and just letting go of that fear and doing it um, is something that's sort of helped me the most. Um, And on these courses, even if you don't execute it well the first time, if you get through it and you kind of realize what you could do better, just keep lapping it um, instead of waiting for the next lap to come around. Um, Just go ride the drop. 10 times after you do it one time and each and every time I guarantee you, you'll feel a little better, a little more confident and you'll know that it's something you're capable of. And by the time the race comes around, you won't even think about it when you go off it. Cause um, I think as most racers know, hitting something when your heart rates at 180 versus hundred or 120, for example, is a totally different beast. Um, so that's why I think if you do, this technical feature that's been scary for you or intimidating. If you do it 10 times when you're just relaxed and cool in the race moment, you won't think nearly as much about it and you'll get through it much easier. Yeah. This is, there's a myth that exists that pro athletes, it's just easier for them, but really I think it comes down to reps, right? Like, and, and Russ, you've had, you know, years, your entire life of building up toward this. Sophia, you haven't ridden mountain bikes your entire life at this pro level. It's only been for the, really the last four or five years. So as a result, you have less reps and you're going through, you're at a different like phase in that process. But the interesting thing is I do think there is a decoupling that exists with all of us where we may have the necessary experience and skill set, but we don't allow ourselves to express that. And that's because of all the fear and intimidation factors are holding ourselves to like past standards. And one thing I noticed, Cassidy, is you mentioned that you, you didn't perform like you wanted to last week at this race. And you said that I was terrible. Those were your words. And I I feel like 
that can be so hard because I feel you on that. And I have been very hard on myself for years mm -hmm. with motocross racing and everything else saying I was terrible at that, but I've evolved that and instead broken it down. Kind of like what Russ was saying in the beginning of this podcast about finding the things that you did well, finding the things that went wrong and then being like very objective about that. And then you have a very clear set of things that you can improve on. And if you break down this big thing, which is technical riding into smaller chunks and break down those small things into even smaller chunks and then just work on them, then it gets easier. But also at Sophia, what you said is working with the right coach is really important. And on our podcast, we've like, I've told, uh, like Nate has been our resident, like Guinea pig mountain biker of like being new and then going through the process, uh, from the, from the gun, so to speak. And I've told him like, no, this is just how you do it because I'm telling him how it works in my head and it doesn't resonate with him. But once we were working with Lee McCormick, that skills coach, it was like perfect. It was, they were speaking the right wavelength and it made sense and it worked and it's clicked, right? So that's, you need to find the right person and the right circumstances, the right environment, kind of like what Russ was saying, not when there's a huge crowd around, he wants to, you know, he does better when it's not like that, same with Sophia. It's always looking at that and recognizing like, okay, how can I connect with this on my own level to be able to weed out all of this crazy circumstance that surrounds this and just focus on what actually needs to get done, A, B, and C. So, um, so Cassidy, you're probably better than you think you are, first of all. Mm -hmm. And then number two, if you can break it down into small chunks, your progress will be really fast. And I bet you'll uh, surprise yourself at how, uh, how good you'll get with it. Um, anything else that you two would want to add to that one? I don't think so. No. Cool. Thanks for joining us. I, this is a shorter episode than normal, but I'm also happy to have, have you two on here, a different crew than normal. I'm also excited because racing is finally back uh, for all of us, but especially for you two. Um, so it'll be fun for people to follow you and connect. How can people find and follow, first of all, Cliff Pro Team? I believe they can follow them on Instagram, correct? Um, but then individually, Sophia, where can people get in touch with you? Yeah, Instagram is um, really the only platform I use on a regular basis. So it's at Sophie Davila, and that's S O F I T H E V I L L A. <laughs> awesome. And we'll put a link down to Sophia's account below. And then, Russell, how about for you? Uh, same. I, I would say I'm most active on Instagram. Um, my handle's just at Finsty. Um, and I recently decided to start doing a bit of YouTubing. So, um, got a YouTube channel now. I don't know the website for it, but, <laughs> or the <laughs> username or handle. I'm a YouTube noob, but um, I don't know. I got a cool new drone and I feel like I ride a lot of cool places. So I kind of want to be able to showcase um, some of the life outside of racing, I guess, because that's a, sure. one of my favorite parts of being a professional mountain biker is where we get a ride and everything. So I want to showcase that a little better. Awesome. We'll put a link down to Russell's uh, YouTube channel down below. And yeah, Russell's also a very good photographer and, and has a keen eye for this sort of stuff too. So, um, give him a follow. Uh, thanks for coming on. And also thanks to the cliff pro team for allowing uh, your athletes mid race week and all this chaos to come onto the podcast. We appreciate <laughs> it. Um, yeah, super exciting. So good luck with the rest of the racing. And if you're listening to this right now and you have any questions for the podcast, you can submit them at trainerroad.com slash podcast and check out the successful athletes and science of getting faster podcasts as well. You can find links down below for that. And yeah, you'll get to look forward to a lot of episodes with Sophia probably in October this year, if everything goes well, uh, because we'll be in Cape Epic together. So yeah, it's not together as in on the same team, but competing against each other kind of on actually, no, we're, we're not even on co-ed teams. So you're yeah, co-ed with it's Nate. It's still going to go fast. So, yes, you true. know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, where we place within our category, right? <laughs> yeah, 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 for sure. All right, cool. Well, thanks a bunch, everybody. And we'll chat with you next time. Thank you. Thanks for having us on Jonathan. Happy to.